1859 trick was, of course, Charles Darwin's. Evolution by natural selection is much misunderstood, perhaps wantonly and deliberately so, as a theory of chance. Really, of course, the essential part of the theory is the very opposite of chance. Chance enters into it in a minor capacity, in the form of random mutations, which are the ultimate source of variation in the gene pool. Without mutation topping up the variation, which is then shuffled through the gene pool by sexual reproduction, natural selection would have nothing to work on. But the driving engine of evolution, especially in adaptive directions, is natural selection. And natural selection is about as far from random chance as you can get. Natural selection is the non-random survival of coded instructions for building bodies that make more instructions like the originals. These coded instructions resemble computer viruses in that they say, copy me. Computer viruses are well named. A biological virus, like the measles or flu virus, consists of almost nothing more than its genome. And its genome is pretty much just a coded program that says, copy me. And computer viruses are the same thing written in computer language. In the realm of life, viruses are just a special case the reductio to almost pure software. Big animals like us, or gorillas or rhinoceroses, are just a more elaborate version of the same thing. A rhinoceros genome, like a flu virus genome, is a copy me program. But the rhinoceros genome says, copy me by the almost unbelievably roundabout route of building a rhinoceros first. If that isn't queerer than we can suppose, it's surely a lot queerer than most of us ever have supposed. The rhinoceros is a giant robot programmed to lumber around the world, eating plants, mating with other rhinos, and spreading more copies of the genes that did the programming. Sycamore genes are doing the same thing by an equally roundabout route, which is different in detail from the rhino route. Gorilla genes are doing the same thing by yet another roundabout route, which again is different in detail. Those details are secondary. Oak tree or orangutan, bacterium or bonobo, DNA is just DNA. And its coded instructions translate into protein following a universal code, all but universal code. The machine code of every form of life that's ever been examined, unlike, say, the machine code of a Mac and a IBM PC is the same. The high-level software for building a rhino or a rosebush is different, but the machine code is identical. Now, building a bacterium is a far quicker, less roundabout, more efficient way to propagate building instructions. So you might say, why aren't we all bacteria? And the short answer is that most of us are. We large creatures are just the tip of life's iceberg, and we mostly consist of bacteria anyway. There's a kind of piggybacking. When all the easy ways of making a living have been used up, natural selection finds slightly more elaborate ways of exploiting those that chose the easy ways. And then, when those slightly more elaborate trades have been filled, natural selection finds even more elaborate trades to exploit them, and so on. There's a gradual escalation to levels of complexity which would seem very queer indeed if we didn't understand the gradual cumulative process that gave rise to them. But we need a bit more of an explanation for the extreme complexity of organisms and elaborate beauty of the illusion of design. Why are animals not just competent at what they do? Why are they so shatteringly good at it? I think the one good reason for it, at any rate, is arms races. The reason carnivores run fast is that their prey run fast. And the reason prey animals run fast is that their predators run fast. Both carnivores and their prey would be better gene-propagating machines if they could divert resources away from the leg and back muscles that make them run fast and instead into making babies. But they can't do that 
because individuals within their species that did that would get eaten first. And so it's not possible to divert resources away from servicing the arms race. The arms race between predators and prey and the arms race between parasites and hosts pushes organisms towards ever more extravagant evolutionary investment, economic investment, in outwitting each other and further away from a comfortable optimum that they would prefer, just get, getting on with reproduction, they would prefer in all other respects. Why do trees grow so tall? Because their natural habitat is a forest where rival trees shade them. Trees grow tall solely to overtop other trees. But that was a digression. I was talking about evolutionary arms races as the explanation for not just the running speeds of predators and prey, gazelles and cheetahs, just about every example you can think of where a living thing, or a bit of a living thing, is beautiful, complicated, or dripping with the illusion of deliberate design. Eyes and ears, hands and claws, stings and wings. With exceptions that I won't go into, although they're deeply revealing, living things look as if they've been designed and delicately tuned by a master engineer. That complexity, especially the sensitive fine-tuning, it's, I think, mostly because they're the end products of evolutionary arms races. And what I want to suggest to you is that if we didn't know that biological evolution was true, if we weren't witnessing it as end products of it, we'd think it was science fiction. Queerer than we can suppose. What is it that makes us capable of supposing anything? And does this tell us anything about what we can suppose? Are there things about the universe that will be forever beyond our grasp, but not beyond the grasp of some superior intelligence? Are there things about the universe that are in principle ungraspable? by any mind, however superior. It's worth recalling Wittgenstein's remark on the question of why common sense is surprised to learn that uh, the, the earth spins rather than the sun goes round the earth. Tell me, Wittgenstein asked a friend, why do people say it was natural for man to assume that the sun went round the earth rather than that the earth was rotating? His friend replied, well, obviously, because it just looks as though the sun is going round the earth. And Wittgenstein responded, and you have to think about this, Wittgenstein said, well, what would it have looked like if it had looked as though the earth was rotating? In the world in which our brains evolved, Extremely large objects are less likely to move than small objects. As the world rotates, objects that seem large because they're near, mountains, trees, buildings, etc., all move in exact synchrony with each other relative to heavenly bodies such as the sun. Because the sun and stars seem small by comparison, our evolved brains invent an illusion of movement onto them. And the point I now want to make is a generalization of that. The way we see the world, the reason why we find some things intuitively easy to grasp and others hard, is that our brains are themselves evolved organs. They are evolved to survive in a world where the objects that mattered to our survival were neither very large nor very small, where they either stood still or moved slowly compared with the speed of light, and where the very improbable could safely be treated as impossible. Science has taught us, against all intuition, that apparently solid things, like crystals and rocks, are really composed almost entirely of empty space. And the familiar illustration is a fly in the center of a sports stadium. The fly is in the center of a sports stadium, and the whole of the empty space between the center of this sports stadium and the next sports stadium, where, where there's another fly, is, represents the distance between one atomic nucleus and another. The hardest, solidest, densest rock is, quote, really almost entirely empty space.